We're here in Cambridge at the Raspberry Pi Foundation with Dr. Sam Aaron from Cambridge University Computer Laboratory and creator of Sonic Pi. Sam, tell us about Sonic Pi. What is it? What does it do? So it's a very simple program that you can use to turn text or code into music. Um, and I've built it to help teachers teach the new computing curriculum. So I've actually developed it with, in the classroom with teachers. Yeah. And it's uh, the easiest way I think you can actually make a sound and actually then turn that sound into a fully fledged performance or composition. Okay, can you show us it? What? Right, so they, obviously they, in classrooms you need to be able to get the message across really quickly yeah. and simply. So here we've designed it to be as, as simple as possible to get started. You just write the word play. Choose a number like 70, press the run button, and you can hear a beep. A beep. Right. <laughs> and uh, the cool thing about this is that we can talk about all the sort of learning opportunities here. So we can sort of see that the number 70 is what is that? It's an abstraction. It doesn't really mean anything okay. unless you apply it to a context. And here that context is that of, of pitch, of notes. Mm -hmm. So if you have a higher number, what might you have? A higher pitch. A higher right? pitch, yes. right. So yes. let's just yes. go for like, say, 80. Yeah, high high pitch, pitch, yes. Or 760. <laughs> Lower pitch. Yeah. So at this point, we can play all the numbers we can imagine, which, okay. is, which is interesting. Wow. <laughs> yeah. But of course, then, if it just did one note at a time, that wouldn't be very exciting. So you can use this to make melodies. So the, the next thing you can do is to play two notes at the same time, which is chords. Hmm. Now, this is, might be strange to, to people who might maybe expect a 60, then 65. But so we're used to computer programs being one thing after another. Precisely, yeah. yes. And, and they are actually one thing after another, but yeah. so sort of crazy quick, you can't hear the difference. Okay. Um, and so what we have now is the ability to make chords. So if we want to make a, a clear distinction between note A and note B, then we need to introduce one more command, and that's called sleep. We write that like that. We have a simple melody. Yes. And it, what's interesting here at this point is that, and what might surprise people, is that if we take sort of Western notation, so scores and staves and squiggly lines yeah. and dots, all that sort of nonsense, well, not nonsense, but when you look at it, code, actually, it's it, another form of it's abstraction. Form of, oh, yeah, yeah, but for yeah. certain people, yeah. it's, what is that code? When you look at code for the first time, that looks like nonsense too. Okay. What is all yes. these yes. crazy symbols? Yeah. Um, but when you learn to decode, it actually turns into meaning. Mm -hmm. um, and the interesting thing about this notation, the Western notation, is that this code here, these two lines, actually represent most of that. Yes. So yes. with something I've just shown you in sort of 30 seconds, yeah. you could actually use to describe all of the melodies you can ima imagine, all the rhythms you can imagine. Yeah. So you can take any of your favorite songs and riffs and translate them to places. So a student could take a piece of music written in traditional notation and convert that into a Sonic Pi program. Absolutely, and they do. And that's really okay. And that's a worthwhile activity? Uh, of yeah. course, because so, at that point you're talking, there's lots of, again, again opportunities for learning for the teachers yes. to talk about yeah. taking ideas from one context and mapping it onto another through code as the medium. medium. So in computing terms, we get to sequence very, very quickly there as a sequence of instructions. Precisely. Other ideas like repetition or randomization. Of course, they're also present in music, which is much, much they are in code, okay. and we can, we can use those absolutely. So here at this point, we can say, well, I actually want to be able to do this particular melody. It's not exciting, but let's say I, want, I really like it a lot. Okay, yes. I want to do it uh, four times. All right, four times. And I choose a do to say, well, I want to yeah. start my melody ends where I want to finish my melody and now I have it repeating four times. That's wonderful. So yes. at this point I could do any any code inside there and it would repeat that code four times. Right, oh, yes. That's that's hugely yeah. impressive. <laughs> okay. Um, so so this is this looks as though it's sort of Ruby based. It's entirely Ruby based, okay, absolutely right. yes. Right. What, why why Ruby as your language of choice? So um, personally, I used to be a professional Ruby programmer. Okay, and, uh, that's I good reason. <laughs> I wrote, I know, but also when I was in my PhD, I also used Ruby, and I, I know it's a very powerful language to manipulate it. Mm. So I wanted to take the language and morph it like clay into something that I wanted to use. In this mm. case, I wanted to take the language and morph it into musical instruments. Mm. And so I knew Ruby had constructs which allowed me to do that. And also, it is a, as a completely professional programming language. Twitter was originally written in Ruby. The, the UK government write all the stuff in Ruby. So it's a, it's a very well used yeah. language. And also has this advantage where the white space, the space before the words, doesn't mean anything. Unlike some programs. Unlike, Unlike some programs. <laughs> so, and, so, um, and for me, that's important because children do like to write messy code. And mm. I think that when you're starting, it, it should be tolerant to that. Okay. I think the, the requirements of a language for teaching are not necessarily the same as the requirements of language for a professional programmer. No, no and quite. when we ask the question, which is the better language for a professional, that doesn't necessarily translate to which is yeah. better for a teacher. Yeah. But could you do something similar to this in Scratch? Oh, 
Absolutely, yes. Right. And in fact, actually, Scratch was a, a, a real inspiration to Sonic Pie and its constructs. Okay. And actually, if you if you look at it with sort of tinted eyes, you can actually see Scratch inside it, inside Sonic Pie. But that perhaps makes scaffolds that transition from block-based programming yes. into a text-based language very exactly. nicely. Yes. And you have that immediate feedback on what you're doing. Absolutely, yeah. yes. I mean, in fact, you just need to sort of draw boxes around these things and it becomes yeah. scratch. So. And you mentioned earlier that this isn't merely about composition, that this can be used as performance, this, this becomes a musical instrument. Absolutely. You know, the, 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 the way it turns from a composition to performance is you introduce something which, unfortunately, isn't in the curriculum today. And so this was a question that I got asked by every single classroom I've been in over oh the last three years. Uh, and that is, once I have my melody and I have my bass line or my drums, how do I play them both at the same time? Yeah. And uh, the curriculum unfortunately doesn't offer an answer to this. Of course the answer is concurrency. Okay. Uh, and so uh, in Sonic Pi I developed a tool for in, in introducing concurrency at the age of six to ten that they can already understand and get. Well, can um, you show us so, yeah. that? So sounds, sounds amazing. Let's let's just break this down to some of the other things. So another thing we can do in Sonic Pi is play samples. We can play mm. any pre-recorded sound, and so this allows children to go around with their iPhones or uh, recorders. <laughs> uh, there's also a bunch of built-in ones. So let's choose like a drum sound like this. We have a drum sound. So if we're going to play a sort of a, a, a dance kind of music, we want to repeat this. Yeah. So we'll use like a loop to do this. See for half a second ends. Now we have our bass loop, which is great, we've got an infinite loop going around. But we also, in our heads, we want to think, oh, I want a bass line that goes with this. So maybe also at the same time, we want to have something like this bass sample. Play this once every second. Right, so we want to be able to combine the two. So children, from, from day one, they'll straight, straight away try something like this. So they'll say, I'd loop the bass drum sample, and I'd like to loop the, uh, the other sample at the same time. So let's play them both at the same time. Mm -hmm. And this one had a sleep at 0.5. And so they would write something like this here. And of course, we don't hear them both at the same time. This is a great opportunity to explain how sort of sequential programming works. Yes. But once a program gets into the loop, we're inside state, the forever loop. That makes sense. some time to me. Yeah. <laughs> so the code never, ever, ever gets to line six mm -hmm. to nine. Mm -hmm. um, and so the solution I created, and this is a, it's a system that there's no other programming language, wow. is to convert a loop into what I call a live loop. Okay. And so all I need to do is to change it to a live loop is to write the word live in front. And then also, uh, each live loop needs to have a unique name because these are now performers. Mm -hmm. These are my band members. I have, a per I have Kate playing the, the bass sample and Sally playing the house drum. Oh, nice. So yes. Okay. It's very powerful. Like this, yes. Sally. And now, they're both playing at the same time. It's concurrent. But you asked about performance. Mm. And so I can actually comment this one out and uncomment oh. it out. I can change the rate of this, <laughs> pump it out maybe, and maybe change the cutoff of this to 70. You may ask, what, what is cutoff? Well, if I change the values, you start to hear how yeah. the sound gets more and more bright. But notice it's not the missing of beats. It's all entirely in time. Yes, it is, yes. Let's see what you mean about the brightness to that. It's <laughs> lovely. So, yeah, so yes. the live loop enables yeah. performance. It also enables concurrency and modification. And, and I've observed that and children... six-year-olds get this. Yes, absolutely. Yes. And Very good. I mean, there was, a, there was a competition entrance to uh, uh, the, the Ten Pieces competition by the BBC yes. where children using these constructs and they became finalists using yeah. Sonic Pi. So, I mean, these are primary school children. Um, and so it's entirely possible to get this. I mean, six-year-old might be a bit, bit young, perhaps six, six to ten, that range, mm -hmm. is when you can start to get this kind of thing. Um, but of course, what we're doing here is we're enabling people to tweak and change yeah. very, very rapidly, yeah. which, which I think, again, sucks people in. They haven't got to write lots of things, mm. hope it's going to work, and then press run a bit later. That sense of it being something which you experiment with, yeah. which you play with. And tweaking literally. and playing, yes. and finding it joyful, yes. and just inviting you just to keep modifying and changing. It's so nice. It really is. So how much music does a child need to already understand to be able to get started? With That's this? a very good question, and I've designed it specifically so a child needs to know nothing. Wow. Um, okay. And I think actually that's the most interesting thing is yeah. that, that when you start to say that you need to understand this level of music theory or this mm -hmm. level of, of background, that may be, may be useful for you as a comp composer or someone getting started, but also restricts you. Mm -hmm. um, the amount of knowledge you already have, like certainly if you're working in Western music, you'll only write Western music. With a system like this, we don't have a default BPM, we don't have a default tuning. Like and you're free the, to move the, out of these the, the number you put into your play command doesn't have to be a whole number. It could be a fraction, yeah. exactly. So 
what, what's really interesting is that children should be able to write music that they enjoy mm -hmm. and not worry about whether it sounds the same or not the same as other music they listen to. So I think it frees them from those constraints. Okay, and there's a full tutorial written for Sonic Pi which assumes they know nothing about music and also mm -hmm. nothing about code. Wow. So they can learn both at the same time yeah. by writing the literature. So just as what is it, 36 years ago, Papa was arguing a child learnt mathematics through programming the turtle, not learnt yes. mathematics so they could program the turtle. You've got a similar thing going on here with, with music. And yes, and, and so um, I, again I've observed in the classroom that when you've gone to teach important constructs in computing like variables mm -hmm. and functions, mm -hmm. so those lessons have just fallen on the line, okay. completely down, because unless you're already intrinsically interested in these things with their own abstraction or beauty, which weird people like me are, Mm. Um, you're not going to say well, why, but I see why this is actually a useful and important thing. However, if you say today we're going to learn how to do a baseline, that's a much more interesting proposition to children. Mm. Mm. And then to do that baseline, well, what do we need? We need a list mm. to store the, 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 the notes to play. We need some construct to iterate through that list. We need some mechanism to play each note in that list. So suddenly the computing constructs come out by necessity yes. to, to achieve yes. something that children actually are interested in. And similarly, I, I, I've seen a lot of people talking about things like sorting being uh, an exciting thing to engage children with. Oh yes, tremendously <laughs> exciting. <laughs> but uh, for me, uh, I personally, I'm not particularly excited by sorting my socks. Or, and so uh, children, again, maybe some of them will be uh, just engaged, dribbling to do sorting. Yes. But, but maybe not. Maybe there's yes. other, other ways we can wrap computing that might mm. uh, engage mm. a broader audience. Mm. Thank you. Um, now, in some music lessons, and indeed some computing lessons, children learn about sequencing software, music sequencing software, yes. which we might produce a very similar output to what you're doing using code here. What's the advantage to using something like Sonic Pi, or well, using Sonic Pi rather than sequencing Yeah, software? so if you're a music teacher looking at teaching music, mm. then yes, that's a good question. Um, why would you look at code? Well, there's lots of many reasons why the code can offer a, a different way of working okay. with, with the music. Again, in Sonic Pi, you can just ask it for all the different scales and it can give you a list oh, of them. Okay, so, so again, we can learn through experiment and discovery. Yeah, well, precisely. Yes, so now we're taught what a P3 minor pentatonic is. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Okay. So, uh, and you'll see what some of these sound like. Um, and so, what I can do now is create one of these live loops I showed you before. Yeah. Let's call it Foo for fun. And what we're going to do is play notes.tick. And tick is a special command which will play through each of the notes in order. Okay. And I can change the release time of that to be short, so it's nice and percussive and sleep for a short amount of time. So now what I'm going to do is play through this scale. We can hear sort of very simple arpeggiator. Very nice. Yes. But what we might want to do is to shuffle this thing, which is using randomization. Yeah. And now we have a different organization, but yeah. it's, it's the same every time. So we have this repetition. And so if we like this, this particular melody, maybe worse, if we add another, another octave in here, we can actually hear clearly what's going on. We hear this sort of melody. This might be our melody. Yeah. And, but if we don't like this particular order ring, we can change it. We can use a random seed okay. to actually say where to start in that stream. That so this is the deterministic in. randomization, yes. that it seems random, but yes. actually this is all down to whatever seed you put into the random Precisely, function. and that seed yes. is also already, already chosen for you every time you press play. Look. Okay. It's always the same. And so if I like this piece of code as my yeah. melody, I can just cut and paste it, give it to somebody else, and they have it to start their melody yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. But if I don't like it, I change the seed, use random seed, let's say 3000, some other number. We have a different order. Yeah, right. I'm going 30. But again, so yeah. my composition now boils down to just changing the seed until I find... There's not an obvious relationship. In fact, there shouldn't be. An there isn't an obvious relationship. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, the, no. The, yeah. um, although it, is, it actually is, uh, if we're going to we spend hours talking about the randomization, <laughs> so there, there is actually um, a, a relationship that's, which is gr greater than the typical randomization system ah. in programming languages, in that uh, this isn't, you can't find all melodies in the randomization stream, it's not infinitely random. Oh, you can't sort like a yes, library of yes. all libraries. Okay. I have a, a finite number of random uh, uh, values I've pre-generated, yeah. and I work through that list. Right. And so setting the seed is actually jumping to a point of that okay. list. So random seed 31 is the same as 30 dropping the first round. So oh, I, and that oh. actually, though that sounds less random, <laughs> and philosophically is less pure, yeah, it's actually yeah. much more useful when I'm making music to be able to manipulate oh. the Okay, so and it means I can also go backwards in the random stream as well as forwards. I can yeah. undo calls to rant. Yeah. So there are teachers using young it to teach computer this. science. Yeah. There are teachers using it to teach music. There's teachers using it in, in uh, school clubs. Mm -hmm. um, there's 
universities are using it to teach music and music wow. technology. Right. Um, so I've been to sort of seven universities in the last yes. year and a half yeah. to talk specifically to music departments to demonstrate this. Um, there, I went to a school uh, in, near London where the year before nobody had applied to GCSE music. And, uh, and I was there with, with another person as well. We both gave a talk about why computing is, is interesting and exciting. Uh, and I used Sonic Pi as my, my tool for demonstrating. The uh, next year it was the most subscribed to GCSE course. So tools like Sonic Pi really can awaken people's understanding of what code is. And it's, that's one of the things that frustrates me is when you, when you see people talk about code, they say, well, it's very important. But they don't really know why. Mm -hmm. and, and then if you sort of press them a bit, they'll say something like, it's good for being a professional programmer. <laughs> And well, that's that is it's true. true. Yes. However, but that you don't might not be the most motivating thing for every child. No, but <laughs> and not every child should be a professional programmer. Just yeah. like not every child should be a professional sports person, or indeed a professional musician, or a professional yes. mathematician. Yes. Right? yes. Okay. And so, or professional writer. Yeah. But we never say you shouldn't learn to read or write. Mm. Everyone should learn to write, read or write, regardless of whether you can become a professional or not. I think the same is true of code. And so. Looking at the reading and writing analogy, what else, what other purposes do we learn to read or write? Yes. And there are many of those are creative purposes, yes, to express right. ourselves, to write yes. diaries, to write letters, to write lyrics, to rap songs. Right. Um, similarly, code, I believe, is also a powerful medium of creative creation. expression and a way of understanding at least some part of the human world. A different yes. part, yeah, it yes. gives us tools to understand different parts, yes. exactly, and express Very those different things. Okay, so a teacher who's never used this before, what's the best way for them to get started? Well, download it, for starters. Okay, that helps, yes. <laughs> if you go to the website, sonic-pi.net, yeah. you'll see downloads for Mac, for Windows, and also for Raspberry Pi. In fact, for That's Raspberry Pi, it's installed by default. Right, right? Yes, so you don't yes. even need to install it if you've got a Raspberry <laughs> Pi. Um, and uh, so they op download that, open it up, and inside there, if you click on the help button, there's this tutorial built in, so you can work through this right. tutorial here. Uh, and it's teach you all the things you need to know and more, yeah. uh, and uh, will really get you started. Of course then, once you read that, if you want to fi figure out how to actually use it in your classroom, the Raspberry Pi Foundation have a fabulous scheme of work which is freely available, right. uh, which is on the Raspberry Pi's website. Thank you. Uh, yes. And then also there's this, there's this book as well, which yeah. I've written, which is uh, you can buy for a few pounds. This is also the Magpie magazine. Yeah. Yeah. It's also yeah. free to download as well. Okay, that's yeah. great. Thank um, you. And that will jumpstart you into different aspects of music. So here we can sort of see how we can take music notation, yeah. translate it. We also have, if you've got a Raspberry Pi, it also has a free version of Minecraft. Yeah. Sonic <laughs> Pi allows you to make musical Minecraft. So you can oh, use sorry. Minecraft. How, what is musical Minecraft? So that's, you that's can, what? I've just shown you how you can make some basic beeps and, and drums. Yeah. But the same constructs I can use, I can send messages to Minecraft, to place blocks, to move Steve around. Oh, wow. And so I can create music and create visuals in Minecraft yes. at the same time. Yeah. I can live code Minecraft <laughs> as much as I can live. And I've used Minecraft in, in performances yeah. and music venues yeah. as the, the, the tool to, to, to visualize. The visualization of yes. music. Precisely. So in, in this book we have a whole article on how to do articles yeah. on how to do that. Yes. Sam, this is so interesting. Thank, Thank you. you so much for showing that to us. This well, I hope you have a play with it soon. I will. Thank you, <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.